como mexicano, descendiente de campesinos, de gente humilde, trabajadora, gente que sabe lo que es sufrir y luchar. Me dedico al estudio de las injusticias sociales. Por eso hoy les voy a platicar de la filosofía política que se estudia, que surge de pueblos como de los que yo vengo, de los pueblos de América Latina. Ahora, la filosofía... Just kidding, I'm gonna... <laughs> I'm, gonna I'm gonna continue in English. <laughs> so, so, I'm a philosopher. I study philosophy. Philosophy is uh, thought of as the study of questions about existence, about what we can know, about how we should live our lives. When most people think about philosophy, though, they tend to have in mind Europe or ancient Greece. Since I'm interested in Latin American philosophy, the question I always get is, who are our philosophers? Who are Latin American philosophers? They're hard to find. <laughs> I spent my whole uh, first, oh, my whole uh, academic career as an undergraduate uh, majoring in philosophy without encountering a single Latin American author in my philosophy classes. I had to go outside of philosophy to find them. When I talked to one of my peers about this once, and she asked me, well, what does Latin America have to offer besides bananas and dictatorships? So in one question, uh, Latin America is reduced to containing just two kinds of things, goods that can be extracted, bananas, and you know, social and political pathology. In the 80s, the social critic and political thinker Eduardo Galeano said that this is the way that people think about the oppressed of the world. He said, we are the nobodies, the nobodies who don't have culture but folklore, who don't have religion but superstition, who don't have languages but dialects. I became interested in Latin American philosophy because both because I found it intrinsically interesting, but also because I recognize that this pattern of thinking about the region, these stereotypes that say, that tell us that Latin America doesn't produce anything of intellectual worth, that they were wrong, and I wanted to fight them. But I also realized that they're part of a bigger pattern. They're a part of the language that often gets used to justify colonial projects. In the old times, the old colonizers, thought of our indigenous ancestors as ignorant savages who needed to be dragged into the light of truth. In that time, the truth was Christianity and European culture. In our time, modern day colonizers have the same reasoning, but they've switched out Christianity for modern uh, forms of capitalist development and governance, which turns out to be just new ways of recolonizing Latin America. If then this is the pattern that uh, comes to justify colonial projects. We can ask ourselves, what, who then are Latin American philosophers? I'll give you some examples. In the Aztec Empire, Nezahualcoyot was a ruler, a poet, a philosopher, among other things. He composed poetry about the ephemerality of existence, about um, the div divinity, about nature, about friendship. But for the Aztecs, poetry had a very deep philosophical meaning. It was one of the only things that could disclose reality to us, that could reveal the sacred and creative energies of the cosmos. So here's an example of one of his poems. He says, what will I take with me? Will I leave anything after me on the ground? How will my heart act? Perhaps we come to live in vain, to sprout on the ground. Let's at least leave flowers. Let's at least leave songs. So the Aztecs referred to flower and song. That's what they called poetry. Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz was a nun, a philosopher, a poet that was unrivaled in colonial Mexico. Um, she was at a time when women were thought to be unfit to study the sciences or philosophy, a polymath, right? She studied all the subjects. She knew a lot of things. And her genius, because she was a genius, 
became a threat to the colonial administration, to the ecclesiastical authorities, so they eventually silenced her. But not before she made history by arguing that women had a right to an education 100 years before Mary Wollstonecraft did the same thing in Europe. So that Mary Wollstonecraft is regarded as the first uh, English feminist. So Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz is kind of uh, proto-feminist in the colonial Mexico. So these are thinkers that are sort of from a long ago. But there's exciting stuff going on today in contemporary Latin American philosophy. This is Oscar Guardiola Rivera. He's wrote a really interesting book called What If Latin America Ruled the World? And in it, he argues the following. Contrary to what you might think, it's the South that's going to drag the North into the 22nd century. And that's because in, the, in Latin America, people are rediscovering through grassroots social movements an old idea that could be what saves us from the perils of contemporary global capitalism. And that's the following idea, that society should be based not on the accumulation of private property, but on the collective effort to create and sustain future environments. So in other words, it's the idea that the commons, land, air, water, should be not a thing that we enclose and commodify and sell back to people, to the public, but rather the communal space where we realize our collective and spiritual good. In Bolivia, the Aymara political thinker and sociologist, Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui, argues that there's a need to think of Latin American realities based on, uh, from within the perspective of indigenous knowledge systems. So one concept that she's interested in comes from this Aymara proverb. So this is not Spanish, this is Aymara. That goes like this. Keep naira ut nazis sarnacapanyani. The idea, so here's how it, what it translates to. Looking backwards and forwards, we walk in the present towards the future. So I'll say it again. Looking backwards and forwards, we walk in the present towards the future. So the idea is something like this. In some sense, the, the past is always behind us. We've already lived through it. Uh, but in some, another sense, it's always before us because it's what we have to orient us in the world. The future, however, is unknown. In that sense, it's, sort of, it's also at our backs because we can't see it. So it ex this proverb ex expresses the following sort of idea that the present is always already pregnant with the past, that it erupts in the here and now as we are irresistibly hurled towards the future. Latin American philosophers have always been interested in the meaning of our history. That's kind of a, one of, a thing that happens when you suffer colonization. <clears throat> so we get this important lesson that we can learn from Latin American philosophy, which is the following one. You can't exercise authentic agency. In other words, you don't know what really matters and what ought to matter to you without understanding the history that has shaped your culture because that culture has shaped you. There's a need in the US to learn this today. <laughs> uh, so I can end with some thoughts on this topic, The Dangers of Ignorance of the Public, by Jose Marti the father of Cuban independence. Martí, at his time, was worried about the expansionist tendencies of the US. And he warned us that it was the scorn of the formidable neighbor to the north, these are his words, that poses the greatest threat to our America. He said, through ignorance, it, uh, the US would come coveting our America. So here, our America refers to Latin America. But the more that it intimately, that the US came to know Latin America, the more likely the chances were that it would respect our sovereignty. So Martí had faith sort of in the best of the US. But he also distrusted the worst of the US. He died not only fighting for Cuban independence, but because he thought if you got Cuban independence, that would prevent the US from using the Caribbean as a launch pad to dominate the rest of Latin America. So these are his last words. He said, I know the monster because I have lived in its lair, and my sling is that of David. <laughs>
So I like to think that by the sling here, he's referring to the power of his words to prevent, just like David slew Goliath, to, to drive back ignorance. So I'm not as uh, politically an idealist as, as much as Marty was, I think. But if I didn't have some faith in the power of words, I wouldn't be here in this room with you. Um, but here I am. And uh, here's my sling. Thanks. <laughs>